Okay, welcome. Now, the folks thought we would just start it. Um, so, uh, a little bit of, uh, not this one actually, a little bit of uh, tail um, left over from last week. So, I'll, I'll, go, over, I'll go over it, uh, demonstrate a few more um, steps in uh, uh, skills in SAS, and some of them are related to the homework. Um, but some, some are really important, so I want to say something. And then we'll start this. Basically here, uh, we'll start the first uh, top, first chapter, not first chapter, the first class of talking about uh, predictive models and the danger of uh, predictions and how to, how to deal with it. You know, why does it happen and why you know, we can use some mechanism to, uh, to, to treat it. And then I'll talk about the first model here, k nearest neighbors. Um, toward the end, I will demonstrate how to run a k nearest neighbor model in SAS. It's relatively straightforward. There are a few tricks, and then that ties back to homework three. Right. So let me uh, open the previous slide. And uh, part of the class has a, a discussion and team competition. And this here is uh, the material. Please help me distribute for this half. And uh, retain any leftover copies. So we're not looking at it now, uh, but later. So what's left is I almost finished the um, making graphs for uh, to to examine the relationships between two categorical variables. So two dummy variables. You have two bars and two colors uh, in each bar to kind of show the relationship between the two variables. And. Uh, uh, Part of the, you know, part of the techniques that you can do to examine the relationships, um, other than visually show and get a you know a quick sense of how related they are, another way is go numeric. So, creating creating these these this kind of uh, two by two contingency tables or cross tabulation or pivot tables, uh, whatever you want to call them, and calculate either column. Uh, Proportion percentage or row percentage uh, will help you diagnose, you know, to what extent the two variables are related, um, and you know you can get these uh, from Stats Explorer in SAS. So that's a kind of graph I was talking about. And then, uh, what if, what if you want, what if there are, you know, interactions between two categorical input variable that has may have, you know, something to do with the, the target. So put it another way, all that we have looked at for now, is the relationship between target and one categorical variable. So that requires two by two, right? But 
if there is another variable intersecting, and that's also categorical, let's say binary for now, that the relationship between the two variables we have looked at, you know, such as relationship between churn and international plan, that relationship may depend on the specific category of another variable, let's say voicemail plan. So that could change. Meaning, for example, for those who have a voicemail plan, the previous relationship between uh, between international plan may still hold. You know, those who have international plan tend to have more problems and then tend to you know drop out, tend to churn. You know, that's the conclusion that we got. But it could be possible that the, within those who do not have the voicemail plan, that relationship does not hold. It could be possible. So how to look at it first? You know, without looking at evidence, you cannot rule out anything. Uh, has no basis for 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 uh, progress. Um, you can do that in, e.g., more easily. I will show you what how. But then you know, think about what you expect to see. Within the uh, relationship between two variables only, you expect to see two bars, each of two colors. And then add one more condition, it's overarching conditions, you expect to see four bars, each with two colors, but separated into at least two subsets of the, of the graph to at least uh, to be, you know, to separate them at least when you read the graph. So you will see two subplots, each with the two bars. Uh, or in terms of stacked bars, it's two bars. In terms of clustered bars like these, you'll see four bars, and so two subplots of four, four bars. It's kind of complicated. Uh, let me show you. So we will look at the three-way relationship, churn, international plan, and voicemail plan. Right? We will use voicemail plan as the more higher level you know, um, clustering variable so that in each subplot, we only see one condition of, of the other two uh, of the other two variables, for example, here this is the first graph. This shows everyone with without I think without voicemail plan. The next slide will show everybody with mobile voicemail plan. Within that particular condition, either or not, you still have a correlation between churn and international plan. So to do that. Uh, you open EG. So first thing to do is to create an EG project. You can say you know exploratory data analysis or churn or whatever. Uh, as you see, the process of working with uh, EG is slightly different from EM. You know, Bishma. So here it's not, uh, it, 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 it's still a process model, but it's not as sort of a clear, you know, clearly phased, staged process of data mining here. It, it's more ad hoc, you know, whatever you do, you start on it. There's no particular, you know, uh, rule to go with ordering them. You simply, you know, rearrange. And, and it's, it's, it's auto rearranged uh, for you based on the hierarchy. So here EG is more uh, for uh, st statistical, you know, uh, reporting, graphing, and whatnot. Uh, some of the functions overlap with EM, some not. Um, there's additional power here that you don't see. Uh, additional details, actually, more accurately. You find more details here than in EM. So are you, are you here yet? I've opened the uh, EG and created a new project first. Bishma. We had we just started. We didn't miss anything. So open the EG, create a new project, and start in you know you don't have to if you have your if you have already have your project, open it. You you probably have the churn already there because you did the transformation. 
You have the churn, you have already had these icons, but you may not have that data because that data was in the memory and after you close up the software, the data is gone. But that's fine. This, this is more like a stored procedure. You simply run it, you know, it's a script. Inside the software you run it, you can get that data set back. So right click, if you have the import data set already there, right click that and cl click uh, run. If you don't have it, then uh, the, the, the quickest way, way, easiest way to do, because you have the churn SAS data set, you simply have to open the data set here, um, open the SAS data set by looking into, by, look, by going to the library, I think, and then find the data set. And let me know uh, if you are here already, if you have the data set already. Good. Questions? You got it? Okay. All right. Okay. Brad? Okay. Yeah. So you might be, you know, at this point, and then you don't have to generate all of these. These are from my, you know, history. But we'll do that. Uh, so it's a horizontal bar chart, right? And grouped and colored. So once you have the data set, right? Uh, activate the data set and then go to tar tasks. There's a graph uh, category, a whole list of uh, graphing tools. We'll go to bar chart. Without wizard, we don't need a wizard. Something is wrong. Oh, the data is not here. Okay. To run it. Hide. Bottom. So the kind of vertical, not vertical, horizontal, grouped, and colored. So this one. And notice that you cannot go through and don't panic. Even I do. You know, whenever I see it, it's grayed out, I panic. But it's because we haven't finished all the steps. So go to uh, the, the data tab. So basically, we have to specify three things. You know, there are three, three categorical variables. For us to customer service, no, sorry. Um, voicemail plan, voicemail plan, yeah. Voicemail plan should be the group chart by. So if you do right click, no, if you do uh, right arrow, it will ask you which one. It's the group chart by. So that is um, the highest level, uh, you know, category. And then we will do international plan as a column to chart. Finally, we'll have churn to be the group to group bars by. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, churn should be column, I think. Yeah, churn should be column. So rearrange them. Yeah. 
and basically, let's see the see the graph first. Or run it, I think. Check if you have the same thing with me. And if you run it, hopefully you get the same. Oh, this is. Do you get the same? It's colored. Yours is colored. How come mine is not colored? Well, you select. The different one, right? Did I? Yeah. <coughs> the new one is the part chat two. So, oh, I didn't see it. select the color. Do you have the same? Good. Everybody here? Now, let's see what we have here. So, the group chart by variable is vmail plan. So, the entire chart is separated by two subplots. The upper plot is where everybody does not have the uh, Vmail plan. The, the, we'll look at those, the other ones. So of, of all of these, we see that these are the majority of the sample. We have 3,000, and the longest bar is almost 2,000. So the majority of them do not have the voicemail plan, and it, they end up here. And within this plot, it's something that you're familiar with. The two clusters of bars represent different out, different uh, subscription plan for international calling, right? Most of them do not have the international plan, we know. So they are, the bar is longer, and a small majority, a small minority of them do have the international call. And here, the conclusion is same or different from what we have learned last time, that if you, if you see the difference in the length of bars across the two conditions of international plan, what do you see? Looks similar. Similar, the bars look similar? There is, I mean, the, the ratio, conclusion, the ratio. The, conclu the ratio difference might be similar, right? Uh, people who churn, likelihood of churn of those who have international plan is close to 50. 45%. If you look at those do not have international plan, it may be one to the eighth. So it's, it's somehow similar to what we thought from last time when we look at the entire uh, data set. And that, make, that makes sense because this is the majority of the data set, right? So for the majority of the data set, they represent the majority conclusions that that's fine. And if you look at the, the, the down the, the lower part, these are the people who do not, who do have the, the voicemail plan. And I think if you recall from two weeks from now, uh, from two weeks ago, uh, some some teams looked at the relationship between v, v voicemail plan and churn, and we found that those who have the voicemail plan tend to stay more. So having the voicemail plan and having more voicemail messages tend to you know, lower the churn rate. And so overall, this group will have lower churn rate than the upper part, overall. But let's look at the specifics. If we look at those who have uh, international plan within the voicemail plan holders, 
the comparison is similar. You know, 40% of them did churn. Maybe lower a little bit, but not by, you know, significant difference. And, you know, notice that the number of cases of each of these bars are below 100. So it's really a, a somewhat small subsample. So there are comparisons even closer. But if we look at those who do not have the international plan, it's even more likely that they will stay, right? Because the length comparison, it's one to the 12, maybe one to the 15, as versus earlier, it's one to the seven or one to the eight. So less likely to churn if they do not have an uh, international plan of those who have a voicemail plan. So these are the really, the ma uh, not majority, but uh, those that we feel safe, the company feels safe. You know, these people do not have the international plan to start with. And they fall in, group, fall in this category where they have the voicemail plan. And we know that the voicemail will tend to retain people. So these are the safe category. And, and so conclusion, is there a, a two-way interaction between international plan and voicemail plan? It, there is, and how, how, do, how do you get there? Because everything that we said, and because the fact that the conclusion, the comparison of uh, churn rate between those who have or have not international plan um, differs by the level of the voicemail plan. So all three, all two variables matter in terms of churn rate by the end when we talk about those who do not have the international plan. But for those who have international plan, voicemail message plan didn't change the fact, the pattern. Right? Make sense? So it's just, you know, one graph packs all the information in it. Um, you know, it, you have to take time to kind of unpack and try to grasp with, you know, what's, what's in it. And now you know how to do it, right? Great. And it's saved better yet. It, it's, even, it's even better than EM because the, the graphic floor, uh, it will disappear if you close it, you know. The multi-plot will stay, uh, the result will stay, but the graphic floor, most of them will be gone the next time you open it, or the next time you rerun it. The results, it will only show the uh, two, uh, two bars for the churn, for the target variable. It will not retain the, the other graphic floor plots that you have generated. So better, you know, save a screenshot for your record if you, you know, want to include it in the homework. So, and uh, the, these are basically what I have said. And, and in terms of numeric variables, you know, if you apply the same technique to generate graphs to, uh, to numeric variables, different, different, uh, different chart type, you know, you will, you will generate scatter plots, basically, and histograms for interval variables and you know same places to 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 modify the graph properties and you'll be there so i will skip this the steps for for these general um, numeric variables as for customer service call you you know you will go into you actually go into bar chart because it gives you gives you more options to select group if you go to a uh, histogram, you may have less of a you know wiggle room to to modify if you know lots of things in a graph. And for customer service call, which has a limited number of levels and only has nine you know unique values here, using the bar chart makes it even easier. And then you can rearrange things. You can color code the groups. So I will not demonstrate that. And 
we don't have these options to normalize the bar length, but using a pie chart will do the job, right? But here the conclusion is, among all the um, numeric variables, the customer service call, the, the day mean, and evening mean, a little bit, if you look at the normalized, so this is probably the, 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 the only place that the normalized bar chart will, will be helpful to, is to notice the subtle changes toward a very, you know, very uh, narrow range of, of the variable. Overall, you won't notice a big uh, correlation, but, you know, correlation between evening minutes and turn may be still not big, you know, uh, anyway. But uh, this is useful here. So among all the numeric variables, these are the few that has, it seem to have a, 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 a you know, noticeable relationship with churn. All the other variables do not have such a uh, relationship. But of course, the minute and the charge, they are equivalent because we know that they are linearly related, right? So that's basically what I said. And uh, relationship between multiple variables, that, that's kind of interesting. This gives you uh, a way to look at the two-way interactions between two numeric variables on the target. And suppose we have you know, a, a binary ta target, we have two numeric variables, day minutes and customer service calls. What if the customer service calls, the level, you know, modifies the how 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 likely the, the turn rate changes based on the day minutes used? Uh, you can use the two-way scatter plot that includes two variables, and then you can color code the the, the outcomes, so that you can see a you know a, a, you know sort of a different story within it. And I'll quickly demo how to do it, and you probably can guess. Uh, using the scatter plot. So, uh, we'll go to SAS EM. I have the plot open. Graph Explorer. Now we'll quickly make I'll quickly make a scatter plot with, with the two variables without the groups. So day minutes will be the X. Uh, customer service call will be the Y. As a result, you'll get something like that. Still not good enough. Make it longer and become a square. Uh, so it's a scatter plot, and you know, I think these uh, these dots are too big. You can change it. You know, instead of learning all those sides, changing is good because with so many dots here, we want to see them the the details. So this is good. You know, uh, and the two, the relationships between the two variables is kind of you know mysterious. It's kind of like this this way, uh, an inverted U, where the more minutes that you use initially, they have more questions because they use more the more services and start to encounter more uh, problems. And as I use more, 
they they don't even have that many questions because they get better and they, they learn or maybe not because um, these are different people if you think about it these may be a different another a segment of the people who are very tech savvy they just know how to figure things out or they're super busy they don't have time to cause time for service calls it could be right they don't have time they're using service it's okay they'll keep they keep using it they don't have call. They, they, don't, they don't make the customer service calls to complain so all kinds of the all kinds of uh, explanations um, it will require more analysis of additional information about the, these different segments of uh, customers to better know what's going on. Right? And then, because we have the we have the linked graph, right, in SAS, so I can simply click that. I know which of the dots are turners and the other is non turners but uh, be aware that there are significant amount of overlap here. So all of these dots are highlighted, meaning they are, these dots represent turners, but doesn't mean there is no non turners here. If you click the other side, they, these dots will, will also show up. So, you know, these graphs will only get to, to get to that point. And you can add another dimension by, you know, by not using the link graph, but then you can add a turn as a group, and it shows the colors automatically without you having to collect one group or the other. But you know, these majorly blue doesn't mean they there's no turners here. If I highlight that, you will see a lot of turn and turn turn out there, just because of the limitation of the graph. That you cannot see the whole story, but uh, um, if you look at closely the two subgroups, you may find that you know at least here the blues are not uh, are a minority. So in these sub -sec section of the of the customer base, you have you tend to have those who makes a medium amount of uh, calls during the day. They make a good amount of uh, customer service calls, and they did not churn. They churn, no, they, they churn, churn. Yeah. they churn. So this group, even though maybe only uh, you know, 200 or maybe 300, 10% of the, the population, but the, for these people, you have much more, much clearer insight on what's happening. They are the ones who are using it, you know, to some extent, they value the service, but th th they will value better services. And they need the service. They don't use it a whole lot. They are not as busy. But they need the service, and they have problems. So better address that. You have a, a, a good improvement progress in terms of you know, retaining these customers. What else? OK. These uh, just to repeat what I said. And you know, I don't have to to demonstrate these. The basically you, you generate a scatter plot, you know, a three a sort of a grouped scatter plot with the color codes, and then you can analyze subgroups by looking at additional information by you know by uh, if you want to know specifically what's the percentage of turning in this group, because it's hard to see in the, in the graph, you highlight those, you have another graph on the side, you know, prepared to, to, to plot the percentage of uh, turners versus non-turners. You can see this very specific. In SAS, you can do that, right? So you know how to do it. You, you have the tools. You, you know how to use the tools. You can mix things up to make things happen. And... Uh, Talking about making things happen, um, I got a question from Bao about how to do 
color color coded histogram with a specific number of bins. That's kind of a, a more difficult than I thought. Yeah. Although I, I think the tools are there, but uh, uh, I didn't think uh, you need to, to more do more stuff uh, before you can do that. The, the trick is actually in binning. So in SAS, if you if you want to do color coded histogram, and you still want to specify how many bins you have, you know, in a way to to specify to to configure the bin range, the bin widths, you know. How, how, how much of a range does each bin cover? If you want to you know, micromanage that, it's hard. It doesn't, it, it's not as you know, direct because it's a histogram graph and it doesn't give you that much option. And so the trick to go, to go with that is to pre-bin the, the variable, whatever variable you want to graph into these specific number of bins. The pre-calculate number of bins that you want uh, and, and bin it. Binning is, is you know, putting a whole range of values into categories, and each category will represent one bar. You know, uh, after binning the data, the variable will look like a categorical variable instead of an interval variable. Then, then you have more wiggle room to go in bar chart. Right? You can do a whole lot in bar chart. So I'll demonstrate how to, how to bin. I'll use that uh, uh, I'll use the accountant as the question was about. Uh, no, actually, I'll, I'll demonstrate something new. Uh, for customer service call, you know, we see this pattern. Once a customer makes four calls or above, the churn rate seems to, you know, to be a lot higher. And it will be nice to see <coughs> a grouped uh, or, or cluster or stack bar chart of you know separating the, the the sample into low customer service call people and, and high com customer service call customers and then see the 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 you know the proportion of churning. So we can do that but first we have to 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 uh, to bing customer service call. So let's let's do that. In EM after whatever, after you know, after the side track, basically, because the binning, we don't want it to leave any trace to the main path, so we can do it on side track. And uh, uh, bring an interactive binning, it's under modify. It looks like a bin with different toys in it. So connect that, and there are a few important things to configure before you run it. So here's the deal. Uh, this this one doesn't matter that much, but I changed. So it's up to you if you change it to no or yes, or leave it there. But the more important ones are, wait, hold on. Have you found the binning, interactive binning? Have you dragged it, linked it? And you see this, this uh, window, right? Okay. Um, the first thing is so interval value options. Oh, uh, let me back up. First thing to do, variables. Specify which variables to, to bin. So I think you will see everything as default, right? You'll see everything as default. The, the, uh, the objective is to change most of them to be no. And a trick to select multiple uh, things at once is to first highlight them, and then change one of them within the shaded areas. It will not clear the shading. It will not collect, clear the selection. And once you select something, it will apply to all. So it's quite convenient. And you can, you can, do, you can do it on any one. So for, for most of them, it's uh, it's no. If I if I rank if I sort by name, we'll do customer service calls, account length. It's up to you. That's fine. You can leave it as you can change it to leave it as default, or you can change it to no. 
And then customer service call is, uh, you must uh, select the phone. And very important, for turn, it must be yes. It may be yes already, but uh, change to make sure it's yes. So what difference does it make? If you say no, if you say default, it will do something according to some of the other settings here, you know, default settings. Um, so th that means default, and make if we make sure these settings are correct uh, as, as we would want, then customer service calls and uh, account length will be included as, as the, the base for bidding. And one, one binning grouping variable will be created for each of these variables that has default, or yes, or not yes, um, not, not necessarily. Here, if you say no, it will not be binned, it will be ignored. And for turn, it has to be yes, it cannot be default because it's a target. Yeah, it's a target, it cannot be binned. Uh, it, it, it's been based on some of the other target variable specific settings. So that's, that's the deal. Um, after that, let's uh, click OK. Or update path, it's better. And then exit. Then let's uh, configure some properties. The very important ones are here. Interval variable options. Because customer service call is an interval variable, we want to bin it. So these options will apply. Uh, what we want to do is have the computer pre-bin to whatever number. Uh, I, I use 20 here. It's, ma it's mo mo mostly because uh, it was for binning account length. Now I wanted to bin, create 20 bins, each probably 14 uh, account length unit to have 20 bins, you know, very beautiful, uh, clear, uh, you know, distribution. And then, but uh, 20 will also be applied to what? To customer service call. But because customer service call only has nine levels, and the number of beans is 20, it's, it's, it's over the limit. So it will not do anything. It will bin it according to each unique value. So it will, has, it will have seven or eight beans for customer service call. That's fine, that's what we want. So, and change it to bucket. Bucket means to cut the beans according to the range, not according to how many cases are going into each bean. So make sure every bean has equal length. That, that's buggy. Um, and very critical here for score is to is to uh, to to rule whether or not to do the binning on a particular input variable based on some rule. If if the rule if the value falls short of the rule, the variable will not be binned. And this is some kind of you know. Um, What's the word? Guinea effect. Guinea, Guinea effect is the entropy um, factor. Is how much, how much equalities, how much inequalities are uh, in a variable. And somehow, it has a rule for that. But uh, let's sh make sure it's not using the rule to 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 qualify to disqualify any variable. So change it to no. That's very critical. And then the other things are good. Uh, so for now, we can go into you can go into interactive binning. If it asks you to run it, just run it, but go, don't go into results, and then come back and then click the interactive binning. So which one are we changing to now? The score, the s variable selection method. Okay. Yeah. After that. Try to click interactive interactive bidding. Let me know if you are here.
coming? Go ahead. It's loading. I mean, it's running. Oh, okay. Daniel? I'm still running. Still running. Anybody still waiting? You're good? Good. Sarah? Great. So uh, because I selected two as default, I see two variables. And you can tweak uh, things. And basically, this, this tab is just the uh, information. And we will switch to groupings. This is where you can specify interactive binning. So you can interactively change the bins. Um, default is, you know, the first variable for me is selected. It's, it's uh, account length. So it's pre bin to 20 bins, and the uh, distribution of the 20 bins look like this. It's color coded for you to easily see which one is which, and to see how long the bin is. You know, it's quite nice. Um, then I will switch to customer service calls. So. What I want is two bins only, lower customer service calls and higher customer service calls. But customer service calls is pre bin to nine levels because there are nine levels naturally. Um, the way you do is still highlight and change, highlight and change. So what you want to do is highlight those rows between one to four, one to three, zero to three, or zero to four if you want dramatic results. Um, I'll change to zero to one, no, no, zero to three. So four levels, I will highlight them. I will go here to right click, specify as group as one, which is the same for me. And then after that, highlight the rest of them. Select group, uh, new group. It will automatically update the group to be the next one. Good. And then, very weird, y you need to save it, but there's no save button. So, you know, click close, but wait for the prompt. It will ask you to, to save. And after save, it exits. And then now you should run it. And don't forget to run it. <coughs> well, the results is not that you know, exciting to see basically gives you a report. So what you want to do is to generate graphs based on the grouping, right? So you need to bring up another graph explorer after, right after and connect with the interactive uh, binning. And then, you know, run it and look at the results. And then we can start generating some graph. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do it you know, follow along and try to catch up. You know, these these are, you, know, you have done these. So it's straightforward. I'll do a bar chart, horizontal. I will do a churn as group. But then you'll notice I have two more variables, account length and customer service calls with a prefix, GRP, grouped. These are these are the bind, bind results of those records who belong to which bin, right? So for each binning variable, there's a grouping variable as a result of the binning. And I want to use the 
group variable for customer service calls as the category. And the binning, you know, has limited function for you to label it. You know, I have two bins, one and two, but the two do not make sense for, for other people who don't know the, how I bin it. So it's better to keep some notes about the graph to indicate which is which. So in the notes I will say binning. One equal low CS to equal high CS. So that makes more sense. It's horizontal, so X is frequency. So this is my result. Uh, with the 0, 1, 2, 3 customer service calls all in this one big group. What I want to do is to reverse the order just to have the bigger bar on the top. You know, with the notes, it, it makes more sense. One equal low customer service call. Of those who make uh, a small number of customer service calls, the percentage turning is probably one of the ninth, one of the eighth. One ninth. One ninth. Yeah. Um, and then uh, percentage turning for those who make more than three, four and above customer service calls is one in 50 percent. I think this is still my old binning. Yeah, the, that's why I'm like. Yeah, why so yours is slightly different. Yeah, it looks pretty You have a smaller bar here and longer bar here, and the percentage is not as dramatic. Yeah. yeah. Because, so I, I don't know how that didn't update, but it should, right? Uh, <coughs> because I'm, I'm kind of in a rush, so I may have missed some step, but you get the idea. Um, one last thing is to generate a, you know, those uh, matrix plot where you have 10 variables on the column, 10 by 10, it's a matrix, 10 by 10, and you have 10 different variables. So they form each pair in, in the particular cell, right? And you can generate a scatter plot of all these different combinations to see the correlation between them. So you, you do one graph, you see a lot of you know, scatter plots and give you a sense of what are the, what are the alarms? Are there, is there any alarming signs of uh, high correlations? So let's do that. It's still in the uh, uh, graph explorer. So now this time we'll use a different thing. It's called matrix. But the process is simple. Um, for, for this matrix, it's specifically for scatter plot matrix, so it, it's just for scatter plot. So the categorical variables will not make their way here. You know, all those planned variables are not here. But if it's number coded, you know, like uh, phone, do you have uh, area codes? They are categorical, but they are number coded, so they still go in here. And basically, to make it quick, I just drag everything over, and we'll have a giant matrix plot of, of all the combinations. And it takes some time, just be prepared. It takes like, you know, 10 seconds. So, <laughs> that's it. How do you read? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll show. Um, so, let's see. 
How many variables? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe fourteen. Or fifteen. Yeah. So uh there's still pattern, don't panic, right? This is fifteen by fifteen or fourteen by fourteen, something like that. And then there's a diagonal line that indicate the variable name. So above and uh, below the diagonal line, they they are they are kind of the mirror of each other, correspondingly. And then you you only have to e look at either lower part or upper part. And these things nice, you know, the straight lines, they show you where they where they they are mirror with each other. So these two lines are mirror. So how do you read these? Based on each plot. You stand to the left to see what is the y-axis. Stand to, to, to below to see what is the x-axis. You know, because it's, it's uh, corresponding to the x-axis. So it's a correlation between night minutes and night charge. We know it's linear. So that's why the relationship is linear. And if you look at this, x becomes, inter it becomes night charge and y becomes night minute. Same thing, you just flip the coin. Same coin. Uh, you know, but when you go here, this is a bizarre variable. It's grouping. So the group that I created. Customer service called grouping. There are, only, there are only two groups, right? One and two. So that's why they just they are separated, but only two, two columns of dots. But you mean you know, if you have 500 variables, you know. Um, so you may want to start, I mean, but you can generate something like that and then start digging in. Uh, so you can choose, no, sorry, you can select, there's a special option here, matrix variables selection. You can remove some of them to make it more manageable. So what I will retain are those who will show linear relationships. Okay, so the minute and cause. Otherwise I will I will remove them. You mean minute and charge? Yeah. So you should have eight variables. So that's what I have. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the line retained for every straight line is the same, seg same segment of the day with the charge and minutes. They are mm -hmm. linearly. And so this answers the last question uh, of homework, right? Why do you not have to analyze the charge? Because the charge emits are linearly correlated. So just include this in, you know, and in, in, in provide the rationale. Okay. So that's all I want to demonstrate from last class. Uh, any questions? So this is the, you know, matrix plot that I'm <coughs> talking about. And for for that kind of uh, linear relationships between the inputs in your model, particularly those models that require some human intervention in terms of what variable to retain, you simply do not need to include both variables for the same segment of service. You know, you can include minutes but not charge. You can include charge but not minutes. And even if you include, the model will reject one of them because it detects the perfect correlation. It will break the, the model down. The model will not include and show the result for one side. It will randomly decide. So better decide for itself, right? And that's it. So,
Where's the table? Oh, that's the table? That's fine. I'll use this table. <coughs> All right, I'm excited to start this chapter because that's, that's the meat of uh, predictions. That's the meat. Um, so, so far, you know, the data, data mining methods have two types supervised, unsupervised. The difference? In a brief sentence, supervised versus unsupervised. The, t the, the, the critical difference, well, the surface level difference is there's a target variable in, in supervised methods. Uh, there's no target variable in the, the, uh, the, the unsupervised methods. It, it, it doesn't mean that the target variable has its, its label, you know, stamped on the variable itself. It doesn't mean that. Uh, it means for, for supervised model, for supervised method, you have to have something that can serve as a target variable. For unsupervised method, you could have something that is qualified to be a, a target variable, but you don't have to use it. You don't have to treat it as if it's a, a target. You just don't need a target. And you know the the difference metaphorically is like uh, supervised method is like when you have to learn to pass the driver license test. You know, there's a rule there. You're learning. You make all kinds of crazy movements. You know, and, but it's it's okay. You can do that, but. Uh, if you want to pass the test, you better get rid of those and, and learn how to drive. So having the, the supervised learning is like having a coach on the side, you know, and tell you every time you do something crazy. That's what I did, um, you know, and, and correct it. So this is feedback coming from the coach, and uh, the result hopefully is, is to pass it with high scores. With, lo with fewer mistakes, so it's like that. But unsupervised method is, is more like you you're painting what you see in the in windshield, or you're driving without limits. You know, there's no coach telling you any feedback. There's no objective. You define an uh, objective, but uh, but still, you know, you define an objective. It's not like meaningless task, you know, unsupervised method, basically try to better understand the subject, the, 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 the entities that the data are about, say customers, you know, uh, patients, donors, and whatnot, maybe other companies, your partners, you know, maybe stock prices, or, or anything, behavior. Um, to to separate one type of entities from the other type of entities or group them into smaller number of groups that they each group will share more similarity with, within the, the group than between the groups. That makes sense? So separating things based on the variable that you have without necessarily having a target variable. The most models that we will learn, and including, you know, the the, the the including the final tests, including the group project, are all about supervised learning because that's that's most used, that's most needed. You know, more times than not, data mining project objective is to build a predictive model. It's it's a supervised learning model. But it, it doesn't mean that unsupervised learning is not necessary, it's not useful. It's useful for some other purposes. Um, yeah. Good question. <coughs> some
some methods can be either supervised or unsupervised. It depends on how you use it. So the difference is having the target. Regression, decision trees, neural networks, k nearest neighbors, they are strictly used for uh, supervised learning in, in terms of data mining models. Okay, now uh, the following will be you know, we'll ta I'll talk about the following only in a sense of supervised models from this point on. Uh, we'll bring back the uh, unsupervised models when we hit chapter 11, chapter 12, the clustering. So overfitting is a critical subject in uh, supervised learning in terms of building, an un building a supervised methods to predict outcomes, you know, um, different kinds of outcomes, we'll, I'll talk about it. But underfitting is an underlying phenomenon that you should know and understand before you carry out a um, supervised methods uh, data mining project. And because it's critical, it will define whether a project is failed or not, or succeeds. It will define it. Uh, the over overfitting is a problem. When overfitting happens, the model is ill trained, M most likely over trained. You know, it's over trained. It has demonstrated its power, but it has been misused because uh, overfitting has not been avoided or guarded against. Um, the reason it happens, you know, what happens after when, when the model is overtrained, the model learned too much, uh, too much, you know, differences within the data set that the model misunderstood those differences as patterns that, that the model should apply to predict new cases. So in, in a way, the model has picked up too much noises from the data set than, than what's necessary. And so the model includes both patterns and noise. Patterns, pattern always come first. It will learn the pattern first, most likely. But past one point, it's going to pick up more noises than picking up more patterns. And then the model become over overtrained and overfitting. The noise is th that part of the you know, nuances of the data that doesn't necessarily help you reach your objective. But, you know, data is just data. How do you tell? They don't come up with labels as well. You know, they don't tell. And, and one, you know, in one, cause one, one situation that, that may be noise, in another situation that may be pattern. So it's very context specific, very project specific, and even time sensitive. You know, the model that is trained, that is guaranteed to work the best for, you know, maybe a real estate market that uh, um, um, Zillow purchased. Now, give it 10 years, change, because demographics change, real estate market changes, new houses pop up, and segments you know, neighborhoods change, the rules change. So what was pattern may became, you know, may become noise. So it all depends. It's it's very contained contextual concept. Uh, I mean, not context, not a specific problem. It's very contained, but the, the, the concept is universal. Okay, so this is basically what I said. And take a simple example. You have two colors, you have, um, black and, and uh, red and you know most of the dots are clearly separated uh, except for only five of the dots you have these two I mean you know you have uh, 
these three black dots mixing kind of into the regions of the red dots, the red territory, you have two, three, maybe two distinctively, two red dots going to the, the black territory. The simplest model is to draw a straight line to separate most, if not all, of the points. But that's very simple. That needs two parameters. The more complex one will draw curly lines to try to separate every point to get it a perfect score. But this line may require eight polynomial terms beyond the two uh, parameters, the basic ones. Right? Um, you know, which one is better? What's better depends on how you look at it. If you look at how clean the model is, then the straight line is, cl is you know, very clean, very simple, very straightforward. It's good. But it misses some points. You know, it's, uh, you can't ignore them. It, it, if you're a perfectionist, this is a problem. Uh, but, Okay, the, the curly ones is complex and needs a, a lot of the computational power, but it makes it, you know, makes it all right. How, how, you know, how beautiful is that? But then the question comes, what about this point? You know, by two models, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is one model, simpler model, that it separates the groups. So whatever falls in this territory, on this side of the line will be, will be, will be predicted as red whatever falling on that side will be predicted as black. Uh, the curly line has uh, the same implication, but it's more complex. You know, it makes a lot of turns, but whatever is on this side is, is red. Currently, it's getting 100% cor correct because it makes a lot of turns. So using the complex models, this question mark position, if there's a, there's a point and, and your task is to predict which color it is actually, you will predict as red because it falls on that side of the curly line. But using the simpler model, it will predict black color because it's on this side of the, the line. The two models differ in terms of predictions. Both come with uh, uh, pros and cons. Which one do you trust? That's, that's the problem. Right? If, if, you know, if, I, if I become you know, totally rational, totally rational, and I will, I will look at the majority uh, color of the points that are surrounding that, the question mark. I see, I see more black dots than the red dots, right? That's totally rational without looking at the specifics. So the rule of thumb would be, you know, this is more black than, than, than red, but it's hard to tell because the two models even have conflict predictions. And that may be right. Or you, you may be able to argue, you know, the curly, the, the complex models, they are, they, they, they are need, they are necessary because you do have more than a few points that are exceptional. So the thing, you know, comes down to numerically how to judge the two models. So we will come up with an error term or a performance term, you know, whatever uh, you look at it. Uh, we will have a performance, uh, quantitative performance measure, and whatever model is is better on that measure across all the points, then that model will be selected. So, if we use a that uh, objective measure, then black line is uh, black line is better because it's perfect, right? So black line will always be chosen. If we look at this this data set because it's you know it's perfect, but is that is that the right decision? How to tell if the the black line may be overfitting? It's not that every perfect model is overfitting. It doesn't have to be, but there there has to be there has to be a mechanism. To, to go about. Okay, um, so the 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 way we sort of to prevent overfitting to happen is by 
having some data that are not used during the cleaning process. And so that means if we have some secret data set that should contain the same amount of the same nature of pattern about the, the entities with the, the data set that we use to train the data set, to train the model. So basically, now of all the data sets here, this is the, uh, the, the training set. We use every point here to train the model. We have a secret data set. You know, potentially this just can be new, new, new customers, right? That we don't have data about tomorrow's customer. So, you know, how, how, so these are the secret data set. If there's a way to have some of these, the clicking, um, if we have some of these already uh, available, we can make sure we don't use them in training, because if we do, they become training, and it's liable to the same problem, right? We hold it, we train the model, and we, we apply the model to these points without training the model. The model doesn't change. So the model uses the, the variable here and to, to make a prediction. And because it's secret, we know the, the outcome. Suppose we know the outcome. We can compare them. We can calculate the performance. So we have two data sets here. We have a training set, we have secret data. Let's say it's a validation set or unseen set. Unseen set is a black line. Um, the training set is a red line, um, or maybe a gray. Um, so, and this line, this x axis, indicates the complexity of the model. It's the you know, toward this direction, it's like you you are adding more polynomial terms to make turns to accommodate exceptional points, right? The more polynomial terms that you include the model becomes more accommodating, accustomed to the data set because those terms are specifically to bypass, you know, to include those exceptional points in the training set. So in a, part, in a way, the model becomes complex just to accommodate the special points. So the error, the mistakes that the model will make will become fewer and fewer. It's because the model is trying to accommodate all the points, right? So the line drops in terms of error, the red line. But, and, and the same horizontal point means the same model. If we use that same model at one point and apply it on an unseen set, the black line is where the performance will, will be likely to happen initially black line and red line goes together because the model picks up more pattern than noises. So performances on any data, any subset of data, will increase because the model is doing better. But at some point, it's going to memorize more of the training set, um, you know, spec unique points. And the model makes adjustment to those points, sacrificing generalizability of the model. So if you apply the same model to complex model to unseen set, performance gets worse and worse. That's how it goes into the overfitting region. Hope, hope that makes sense. What, what because it learned too much noise for the first model, right? Not the first model, the training set. Yeah. In the training set. Yeah, That's exactly. That's exactly what it applied. Exactly. In, in, yeah. exactly. This makes sense. This is just to, you know, conceptual, conceptually, to understand it. Uh, I have we have discussions. We have team comp competition. We have other materials. We have, have videos in the next session to to prepare you to you know, better understand what it means and to see some live actions of data generated and to see how model perform, you know, because of the overfitting phenomenon. And then we'll, I'll talk about mechanisms to, to avoid overfitting.
So we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back 35. Okay, let's come back. Um, all right, I talked about overfitting. It, it's kind of a complex you know, concept. Um, to better understand it, let's uh, just see more, um, see more stuff. And I think it will, it will come to you. It will make sense. But uh, see them in, in action. Uh, you have these videos embedded on Blackboard. I'm not sure if you have uh, looked at them yet. Do you know about these videos? They are there. Have you noticed? Yes. It's, you know, by clicking the YouTube video link, you see all of these, uh, and including, you know, the lecture <coughs> recording. Uh, the, the first few are the basics about data analysis and data mining, explain about the data set concepts, and then later ones talk about overfitting. So we'll look at these. The first video is basically illustrating the complex versus simple model using a different kind of a graph. But the voice of the speaker is a little funny. Uh, just, just be prepared at the beginning. So we just saw an example where the decision boundary was really, really complicated. So we have a situation like this. We call this overfitting. overfitting. It and it's a common, common phenomenon in machine, machine learning that you have to be always, always aware of every time, every time we do machine learning. To give an, to give an example, if you look if at, at the data, data over here, here that seems to be linearly separable, a decision surface, surface between red and blue, and blue that, looks that looks like this correctly, correctly classifies the red data, but looks erratic at many other places. That happens when you take your data too literal. And when, when your machine learning algorithm produces something as complex as this, as opposed to something as simple as this, you are overfitting. So in machine learning, we really want to avoid overfitting. One of the ways that you can control overfitting is through the... And then, next one. Uh, so next one, we'll talk about uh, the two lines, you know, the two lines, the, 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 the pattern of, uh, of error as the model gets more complex. So it unpacks the same concepts you know, in a slightly different way, so just uh, with a different taste. I've mentioned oh. overfitting before, but I haven't yet defined it. Before we could define it, and I could give you an example, we needed to have a definition of error. Let me now show you what I mean. Let's consider parameterized polynomial models where we can, one at a time, add additional factors, like x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. Let's create a graph where we have along the horizontal axis degrees of freedom, or d, the degree of our polynomial, and vertically here we'll have the error of our model. So let's measure error as we increase d on our training set. So when d is smallest, our error is greatest, and as we increase d, our error drops and drops and drops. In other words, we're fitting the data in sample better and better. When finally we get to n, where we have as many parameters in our model as we do have items in our data set, our error gets all the way down to zero. This is in-sample error. 
Now let's add a similar line for out-of-sample error. Remember that we expect our out-of-sample error to always be greater than or equal to in-sample error. The curve will look something like this. It'll start out at maximum error about the same as our in-sample line. And as we go down, it'll begin to diverge like this. Now in this region, both our in-sample and out-of-sample errors are still decreasing. But eventually we'll reach a point where our out-of-sample error begins to increase. In fact, it may increase um, strongly. In this area, as we increase degrees of freedom, our in-sample error is decreasing, but our out-of-sample error is increasing. And that's how we define overfitting. This is the region where overfitting is occurring. So let me state that again. In-sample error is decreasing. Out-of-sample error is increasing. When we have those two together, it's overfitting. So in reality, uh, a third of the time you'll see a clear di you know, divergence between the lines. That's where you can clearly tell, and, and the line don't come back. Sometimes the line come back. Um, but in, in the other two thirds of the time, maybe I'm exa exaggerating, maybe three, three of the thirds, or four of the fifth, um, somewhat close to that, you have complex, and you have plateaus all through no matter how long you, you train the model. Well, if you, it will eventually get to the point where it will come back, but uh, for the time being, you don't see it. And you know, in those areas, it's just the, com the data is, is complex. It has different kinds of inputs and a large number of uh, inputs. Um, and uh, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell. But still, the point of divergence still makes sense. Because the uh, even in those uh, in those complex situations, the the out of sample line or the blue line or the um, validation set error line will uh, plateau earlier, sooner than the training set line. The training set keeps improving. The the validation set performance uh, stops and and remains that and then later in you know training set uh, performance inc continues to improve and, and soon enough it will plateau again so two lines are, are horizontal to each other for a long time but that's fine you hit the you know overfitting point way earlier than that happens Uh, so, and just to sort of to to digest this um, concept, we'll do a level, little bit of a uh, have a little bit of fun. Basically, um, having you work harder. same amount of points to the team um, of winning and you'll, you'll base our uh, discussions or the competitions on partly based on the material that you receive this should be consistent if not entirely overlapping with the materials I showed you and the videos that I showed you um, you know it used it has some terminologies that we, we didn't talk about this because it's, it's uh, Wikipedia, you know, it's a diverse community that includes statisticians, <coughs> mathematicians even, or computer scientists and, and different, you know, real life engineers, and they use different terminologies, and sort of they, you know, you see different ways of talking about the same thing, basically, right? Um, so it's fine to use slightly different terminology, but not off the rail too much. Um, so the discussion, the competition will be focusing on 
mostly this material, the slides, the book, and the video. That the video basically competes, uh, uh, repeats what we just talked about. And but uh, with only a few exceptions, uh, in the in the Wikipedia article, it also talks about underfitting. We will not pay a lot of attention to underfitting. So whatever you can skip it or you know you can look at it it's just the, the flip of the coin you know, overfitting the, the opposite side is underfitting under modeling under training model it's a uh, straightforward so we will not talk about underfitting and we'll not waste time talking about that and toward the end there is a subsection about remedy it is entirely not the topic that we're talking about in terms of avoiding the overfitting here, and we will talk about cross-validation um, and data partitioning as a mechanism to, to, to prevent overfitting and to detect overfitting. So we're not talking about those kind of remedies. They are very niche kind of uh, techniques in a very particular area. So we'll not talk about it. Don't bring that up. Uh, and all the rest are safe. So let me announce the rules questions Teams of three, uh, three form the team. I will not assign unless you need my help. So teams of three, 12, perfect, so four teams. Um, all right, so here's a rule. Uh, based on the, the, the topic of overfitting and the problems, the consequences, um, and you know the way you understand it, under the assumption of several assumptions. One, we're talking about uh, supervised learning, supervised methods of data mining, training a supervised model. We have a data set, you know, without going into specifics, you will not talk about the specific. You can bring up uh, uh, examples of data in, in a particular business context or other context or whatever um, that conforms to the assumption. The assumption is that we, we have a data set there's a there's one and only one target variable of interest. You know you can name it if you want to name uh, examples, and we have uh, a large number of uh, input variables. You know x variables, as versus well one target variable. The target variable could take different forms. It can be uh, interval. It can be uh, binary. It can be yeah, let's say binary, as if it's category but binary, or it's. Uh, Interval variables such as, you know, likelihood of donation in terms of likelihood of being uh, likelihood of being a spammer, you know, spam email case, or it can be even survival kind of analysis when the, the patient will die, that you know, deaths, um, and we have a, lo a large number of input variables. Say assume five hundred. It's very large, you know. Um, so based on these assumptions, uh, we have four teams. After a few minutes of preparation, I will call. Uh, I will request for one team, just one team, volunteer, make a presentation about what is an overfitting, what is the source of overfitting what is uh, the consequence of overfitting. How do you know it is overfitting? Um, we're not talking about uh, avoiding it. I haven't talked about it, but we're talking about the source, the origin of overfitting and the, the problem and the consequence based on the materials that, uh, that I have uh, exposed. Uh, the team will present for five minutes you can go beyond the, the materials 
that, that are you know, specified, but uh, not beyond the topics. You can use other materials found online or anything, but not go off the rail. Uh, so that is the, the basic uh, component, the presentation of one team. The one team that volunteers is the basic component. Um, the other teams serve to, to comment and criticize the misstatements and problems and uh, things that are important but didn't, you know, wasn't mentioned or left out. Uh, teams better the, the you know the, the two kinds of teams. One team is the presenter. The other teams are commentator. The commentating teams, the commenting teams, you better take notes because when you criticize, you better point out what is said and have proofs and to be confirmed by both sides. Otherwise, it's it's a false false criti criti critique. Uh, point out where. Uh, where was wrong, who said it, uh, how it was wrong, provide rationale for the correction. Each team will have two minutes of criticism for commentating teams. The presenter team, what, what are the incentives? If, in, you know, in, the, in the ideal situation, if the presenting team said everything right and, and said everything necessary and wasn't critiqued at all by the other or, or you know correctly critiqued by, by any of the commenting team the team will get all the, the team members will get all the maximum points and one percent of the of the course credit <coughs> um, and then but the distribution of the not distribution I mean the, the weights of the points of the presenting members depend on how equally they share the present presentation. If they share it very equally, everybody said different things, but equally amount of information, they all will get the maximum. In the case of unequal distribu uh, distribution of contributions, then they will be penalized in certain amount, depending on how, if, if one person did all the job, or when not, you know, in extreme cases, one person did all the job, the other two didn't speak, and then everyone will get a penalty. Uh, you know that encourages the teamwork. The the critiquing the, the commenting team will get points from will take points away from the presenting team if they cri criticize successfully. And I will moderate the whole process. I will take notes. Everybody will you know with. Uh, We'll, we'll, what's the word? Yeah, we'll observe. So prepare us. I'll give you some time to prepare three, five minutes. Form teams first. Three person per team. Um, yeah. Three of the team. Two of them. Yeah. Okay, so we can board with them. Any any questions? Any questions? How much time do we have? For preparation? Yeah. Oh, for preparation. Three, yeah. four minutes. So quickly you know, browse the, the article. It, it, it just it basically confirms what you have heard. But if you need more time, I'll give more time. Toward the middle of your preparation, I'll ask for <laughs> volunteer, a volunteer team to present. Just like this so, this and then, you know, how to select it. Everybody say, you know, every team say they want. Uh, the more team members raise their hand, the more likely the team will be selected. So, you know, everybody is comfortable. Otherwise, I don't want one team kind of skewed with one person want one, one, one to present, but the other two kind of don't want one, you know, that, that's the mechanism. So uh, after a couple of minutes, I will, I will call.
Okay, this is just for the record. Um, so we have just completed the uh, team competition. Everybody did a very good job. And uh, uh, we'll continue with the lecture. So cross-validation is the mechanism to, as a first step, to, you know, to monitor the, uh, how the models are doing and to have a mechanism to detect how, you know, how, how severe is the overfitting and to, to stop at some point from training. You know, to observe overtraining, overfitting, you have to have overfitting. You know, that's, uh, that's the point. So you have to allow the model to overtrain to the point that it's enough, it's okay. It's okay to stop because there's no point to continue. It's clear, that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is to be able to pick the best model that has the minimal amount of overfitting as indicated by the graph, you know, and then uh, to sort of provide some report material as for how, you know, how, uh, how, how the model is evaluated in terms of training versus validation to have a proof point of the model selection basis. Um, there are different ways of cross-validation for the simplest way is um, two-fold cross-validation is mostly the way we will do it in, in, this, in this course for the projects and homework. Um, you just take a random subset, uh, a random sampling process to subset the, the entire training data set into two parts. And for the benefits of training, as well as you know, validating uh, to see, you know, to see the overfitting, we typically uh, separate into equal size uh, subsets, so the two will be the same. Uh, in, a term, in terms of uh, SAS, the, what's, what's often referred to as the test set is the validation set, is the set of data set that will be, that will be, uh, that, that, will, that SAS will apply the model to. Uh, every trained model can be applied to the validation set and to compare the, the performances of the model on the validation set. So the validation set is the set of the unseen data that are more tested. And there's another subset. That optionally, you can, uh, you can partition, uh, which is the test set. The test set will only be tested once. Um, so it's, it's some, somehow different. So uh, with the, the entire training set, we'll al allocate 50% to the train set, to the train and 50% to the valid validation set, and I'll allocate 0% to the test set for the most part. Um, and with K-fold, it's slightly different. In, a bit in, in the next video, it will visually show the process of K-fold. Uh, as, as, and there's one more option, there's one more method. There are different methods, you know, it comes with the uh, pros and cons. Uh, with the two-fold, you simply do one-time random sampling. So, you know, because of the nature of random sampling, you can get lucky, you can get unlucky, right? So it, it, uh, the, the, the degree to which you can tell definitely about overfitting based on one random sampling is limited. You have variations that you don't see. So that's why the other methods came out. You know, the, there, are, there are K folds where you take, um, K times of random sampling and average out the results. So it's more reliable, but then it doesn't allow the model to be lucky because it averages out the luck. Um, and there's one more which is leave one out. And so they, they tend to be more systematic approach to, um, to, to cross validation. So you can you go through the difference between validation set and test set again? Um, test set is only after you have a uh, you have 
gone through some selection process to narrow the number of uh, models down to only only a few, and then you want to still, and those 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 the a few models, the finalist models, performed equally well on the on the validation set. Do you need another set to just just to separate them, you know, to pick the finalist? So that that that's when you use a test set to select the the, the best ones. The best ball. The best of the best. Yeah. The best model. And uh, but that in introduces more problems. <coughs> you know, for the sake of training the model, you need enough data set. If you don't have a super large data set, uh, yeah, and even with large data sets, it has different subsets. So you don't always, you know, uh, benefit from large data sets. It comes with problems. But suppose you know you're limited on the data set, on the size of the set. The amount of data that you allocate to test data cannot be used in, in training and validation. So you know, those amount of information, you know, there's a certain point that you cannot afford to have fewer data points to train and validate, right? So and then so the test set will, will have to be small, relatively. And on a small data set, how much can you reliably test the best model? That's one question. Right? The best models typically already have all these patterns in it. And then the, the comparison is probably mostly due to um, the, 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 the um, specific points inside the training set and validation set. So the test set, the point, um, the, the philosophy is good, but the reality is not as clear. Right, and in, in terms of regression, because it has an error term, the, the mean square error, and it also has a variance, you can quantify that by um, by <coughs> valid cross validation. So you can com you can you can calculate this kind of um, quantity to balance the two uh, things that contribute to um, overfitting, and the graph just shows that. And so this basically repeats and adds more details and context. This is a way that you can estimate the out of sample error rate for your predictive function that you're building. So the key idea is here that we're going to be so we'll just look at the first half because we're in a lot of time. Into a training data set, a test data set, and maybe a validation data set. And here we're just going to be focusing, focusing on the training data. We're going to subsample that in specific ways in order to build estimates of the error rate that we would get if we applied our prediction function to the test or validation data set. The goal here is again to avoid overfitting. This is one of the key issues of predictive functions. You don't want to tune your data, your predictive function too closely to the data set that you have at hand. The other goal is to make your predictions generalizable or to compare different potential models and pick the one that you think will work the best on the new data set. So this is going to be foc focusing on these three components of the building and prediction function process. So first, uh, we're going to be talking about picking. We're going to be talking about picking features, picking prediction functions and um, using cross-validation to be able to determine which of those features predictive functions are going to work best. So in a regression model, the features are the variables, basically, so there's a mapping. So remember that the study design is, in general, you might have a training data set, and then you might have what's called a, a test data set and a validation data set. You're gonna build models on the training data set, 
then you might test them only a few times on the test data set to do fine tuning, and then apply it exactly one time and no more to the validation data set, and you'll never use any of the validation data set to build your predictive function. So the terminology is flipped. Uh, depends on the software or depends on just to, in, in, in SAS terminology, we're, we're referring to what is referred to as the test set as validation set. We'll repeatedly use it, not as much as the training set, but to to to, to detect the overfitting. But we'll, if there's any test set, then it will be used only a few, only a couple of times. But one goal you might have is while building data, uh, a predictive function on the training data, you might want to know how well is that predictive function going to work when you apply it to the test data set? And so the goal of cross-validation is to be able to estimate that error rate, to estimate the, how well your predictive function will work on that data set. I'm going to use a really simple model to explain how to overfitting it. So this is generated by R, as you can see the code. Um, this only 10 points randomly generated. So these, based on these, uh, these, these, these codes, um, you can be sure this is a one snapshot of the randomly generated points. So what does it do? It generates X and Y very randomly by selecting from a standard normal distribution. You know, so these points center around zero and has a distribution of one. And then 10 points X, 10 points Y, put them together, you have 10 coordinates, right? 10 pairs, uh, so 10 points. And then it also randomly generate a uh, a number from a, a Bernoulli distribution, which is between zero and one, the chance is 50-50, so like flipping a coin, either one or zero, one or zero, 50% chance, so that's entirely uh, random. So everything is random, everything is random. So you cannot expect to, to, to generalize any, to, to come up with any pattern here, it's all random. But with small sample size, you, you kind of see a pattern, but which is a delusion. You know, so the the pattern from these ten points are, if the y value x value probably doesn't have anything to do with that delusion, but the y value is between point 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 five something like point uh, six, and then uh, minus point four or point two to point six. If they are in this region, it's belt, then it's blue. Otherwise, it's green. So that's the delusion. Could be a problem. So in this example, there are two, and then there's plot the x and y values, and I color up x and y correspond to the color blue. That says, okay, if you're the x. So here, it takes the same data from previous slides, and then it infer the the rule, the you know the prediction model, is that if the y falls between this region it will predict it at, will predict as blue, otherwise it's green. So basically, this is the rule of the right-hand side is a prediction model. It shows the comparison between observations and the prediction. So, you know, a model based on these 10 points like that, it's overfitting, you know, because you know there's nothing to be trained on, but uh, the, the model try to infer something out of, uh, out of nothing uh, but you didn't know that, it didn't know that before, right? Um, so the second plot gives you the prediction and the performance on the training set, completely perfect, right? Y value is less than 0.6, so less than about here, uh, data printing. just uh, normal data for X and Y data set. So now we've generated a new data set. I so now it runs the, the it changes the, the randomization algorithm and, and gets a different set of 10 points with different X and Y and colors. So this is the observation, the, the sort of, imagine it to be part of the validation set with new X, Y, and, and Z color. But this is the, the, the real outcome, but you didn't know, suppose you know, you're using the train model to predict it, the outcome is here because everything within uh, the region should be categorized as blue. These two points should be uh, categorized as, as classified as green because of the model, but they really are blue.
again, using just uh, normal data for X and Y, and then uh, unrelated set of binomial data for Z. And if we put uh, a different greater than minus 0 0.2, one dot here that's called blue, um, and the reason why is the data the meaning set, and whenever we're building a particular meaning set is going to be... So we can only go this far. Oh, well, well, yeah, you can keep looking or watching the video on YouTube on uh, Blackboard as well. So let's call it a day. Hope you learned something.